Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today uh, to hear a little bit about my research. Uh, I don't know if you're here because you want to hear about this research or you're just trying to escape the cold and the, and the rain, uh, but whatever the reason, I'm, I'm really honored and, and pleased to be here to get to tell you a little bit about the work that I do. So my name is Audrey Denazel, and I'm a, a lecturer at the Center for Environmental Policy and uh, here at Imperial College. And the work I'm going to talk to you about today is on air pollution. But air pollution, uh, not that I, I'm not going to talk to about air pollution so much as a pro, uh, about a air pollution as a problem, but rather as air pollution as an opportunity, an opportunity for us to be thinking much more holistically about how we can improve our, our health and our quality of life in cities today. So what am I thinking about precisely? Well, what I want to do today is for us to be starting to think about the vision of the type of cities and streets and neighborhoods that we want to live in. Would we rather live in the streets that are pictured on your left or the ones on the right? Anybody wants to live in the streets on the left? So one person. <laughs> well, you'll have to come and defend yourself at the end. <laughs> so the idea is, are streets really meant to be for cars to go from A to B? Is that why we built cities and streets? Or can streets really be made for us, for human beings, for people? And so I'll cover the research that's been done that supports the idea of creating a better vision of developing better cities, healthier cities that improve quality of life and health. And I uh, will be uh, showing all the type of evidence that supports and makes the case for this vision of healthier cities. But to start out with a few words about air pollution. Now, I don't want to dwell on too much on air pollution as a problem because I think we're all very uh, fully aware of the gravity of the air pollution problem and the urgency to do something about it. So we know, for example, it's been all over the news, air pollution kills 40,000 people around the UK and in London alone, it kills almost 10,000 people every year. So we know it's a problem, and not only that, it's not just, it doesn't just kill people, it really affects us throughout our whole lifespan, practically every organ of our body. So we start out with having impacts of air pollution on our birth, low, low birth weight, impairment of con cognitive development, impairment of lung function, it leads to development of cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease, it even, even leads to diabetes, cancer, and the list goes on. So we know air pollution is a problem that affects every one of us at every stage of our lives and almost every organ of our body. Clearly, this is something that we need to be addressed urgently, and I don't think we'll find very uh, much dissent on how much we need to address the problem of air pollution. So given this background, I want to be thinking about air pollution then not as a problem necessarily. It is a problem, but I, don't want, to, I want to turn the problem on its head and think of air pollution as an opportunity. An opportunity for much greater vision of what we can do to improve our health. Why? When we think of problems, about solving problems, we often end up thinking in silos, in a very narrow-minded way. And I think that's really what's been happening in the case of air pollution. Most of our discourse around air pollution is finding technological solutions to improve air pollution. It's finding better emissions control, better fuels, more efficient vehicles. And yes, these better technologies will indeed improve the environment. We can have each one of these types of environments be slightly healthier with a bit less air pollution coming out of every single one of those vehicles. But is that really what we want? Is that really the end game? Is that really the end goal? making these environments healthier with lower air pollution? Can we step back and think really why it is that we actually want to address air pollution to start out with? Why do we want to reduce air pollution? To improve technology? Or do we want to reduce air pollution to improve our health? Now well, that's a revolutionary idea, right? We want to, re to reduce air pollution because we want to improve our health. So why not make improving our health the and goal of our policies. And if we want to th be thinking about how to improve our, uh, our, our health through thinking through air pollution, then let's think about the types of environments that will make 
not only improve our health through lowering air pollution, but we'll have much more holistic vision and, and holistic approach to improving our health. So let's envision cities where we can get out of our homes and walk and meet our neighbors, interact with our neighbors, walk to the local store, bike without having to fear for our lives, where kids can play in the streets. Imagine in every single one of your streets, instead of cars parked along the streets, trees and benches. And imagine instead of zooming cars through your streets, you have kids running after a ball. So that's what uh, the vision that I want to be thinking about. And what I'll be doing now is going through the type of evidence that makes the case to make that kind of vision come to life, makes it possible, that supports this vision, this holistic vision of improving health through the way we plan our cities. And I want to start out by saying that this is not something new. There's historical precedence for addressing people's health, our public health, through better planning of cities. You might recognize some of those illustrious looking old men who are representatives of the urban sanitarian movement. Olmsted, Serda, Chadwick, Baron Hossmann, and Rauch. And these people had a very important impact, had a real mark in the way we, we developed cities back in the 1850s, in the mid 19th century, when they thought and had this very, very visionary idea that you can address people's health through better planning of cities. So here's an example of the expansion of, of uh, Barcelona proposed by Cerda and implemented. Here are some others that were implemented. The uh, Central Park on, on your right, as developed by Olmsted. Rauch in uh, Chicago developed uh, green space, green parks. And all they had in mind, those, those very visionary people of urban sanitarian movement, is that through better ventilation, through more green space, through more sunlight coming into the homes, through better planning practices, better sewage waste collective, collective system, you could improve health by, in these days, tackling the epidemics of the day, which were cholera, the plague. That's what they were trying to tackle. And that had a really important impact in the cities where they worked and across uh, the, much of the world on how we can better improve our cities uh, and improve people's health through, through city planning. Now, we've kind of lost this connection. We've kind of got lost in time in between. And I think it's time to reconnect how we plan our cities and, uh, and how we address public health. So the health problems they were tackling were cholera, the plague. And maybe the problem is that today we think that the major public health challenges are not those, some that can be addressed by planning. But look at this ranking of the biggest risk factors for the burden of disease, for mortality and disease in the world. The World Health Organization comes up with a list regularly of the biggest risk factors that lead to the development of disease, to lead to the disease burden, mortality, and living with a, a disability from disease. And what you see in this ranking, in the top, top 20 risk factors for disease burden, is, for example, of course, right there in number eighth position, air pollution, as you would expect, a major public health issue. And right after that, with about the same number of, of, of deaths associated with it, comes physical inactivity. inactivity. Physical inactivity is a, is a, a, kills more than 3 million people, 3 billion people, 3 million people in the world, there are 3.2 million people in the world today. It's very hard to, in, in, the, in the UK, only 25% of us adults actually reach the recommended levels of physical activity, which is only 30 minutes a day. The other, other risk factors that come up, which are also related to lifestyle factors, are drug use, alcohol use, diet, smoking. And then what doesn't come up in this list, but are also big risk factors and public health challenges, is climate change. It doesn't figure in the list just because of the way we account for things, but climate change is definitely going to be one of the biggest public health challenges of the future. And traffic injuries which is a direct cause of death, death rather than, than, a, than a risk factor. But traffic injuries uh, is actually the biggest cause of death for young people in many countries of the world, including the UK. And what do the, all of these that I've highlighted have in common? Well, they can be addressed through the way we plan our cities, through better 
design and planning of our cities. So, what do I mean by this? For example, if we create spaces where instead of cars, we have space where we remove cars. So remove car removing cars, of course, is going to reduce air pollution. It's also going to reduce noise. It's also going to create, a, 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 it's going to reduce traffic injuries. You're, you're, you're reducing the, the object that will kill the people who are going to get killed by traffic injuries, right, by removing cars. You also create space where people can interact socially and feel, make people feel less isolated. You provide better, easy access to fresh fruits and vegetables that people can walk to. Kids can play in the street. So I'm going to now show the evidence that shows how these types of, uh, of environments really can have very holistic, through a very holistic approach, can show how we can improve our health. Now, the, I have some colleagues in, uh, in Barcelona who did a nice study where they showed, they estimated the health impacts of reaching recommended levels of different pathways or exposures or behaviors that are recommended by the World Health Organization. And they're all behaviors or exposures that can be addressed by the way we plan our cities. So what comes as number one in terms of potential benefits from reaching those recommended levels proposed by the World Health Organization is physical activity. Again, something that's extremely difficult for, for, for many of us to reach. Why? Because we have a hard time finding the time or the money to go out to the gym, make the extra effort to go out the gym, the gym. But imagine if everybody could walk or bike or take public transportation to work as and is encouraged to do so, you don't even notice that you're doing physical activity. Research does show that people who go who get their uh, physical activity from active transportation, walking, cycling, taking public transport, don't even realize they're doing, public, uh, they're, they're doing physical activity and they re can reach those 30 minutes of recommended uh, activity every day. Next comes air pollution, as we've already talked about. Uh, and the same way you can reduce air pollution by removing cars, you reduce noise. And noise is, is the third uh, greatest impact in terms of these different pathways. Then comes heat and green space. Now, green space is, of course, if you inc include green space in your design of cities, you can reduce heat by the same uh, token. But green space, having access to green space, being able to just see green space or being able to play in green space, all that is shown, and increasingly so, to improve mental health and also physical health, even have impacts on mortality, which is what this, this graph is showing. So now, uh, my colleagues in, in, in Barcelona, Natalie Mueller and, and uh, her colleagues, looked at just uh, this pathway and reaching the recommended levels by the, the, the World Health Organization. They didn't talk specifically about, about policies or plans that can be put in place, but those are all things that can be done to reach through better planning practices. But now let's think a little bit more closely about the types of policies that can be put in place. So I have a colleague, James Woodcock, and his uh, colleagues um, uh, in Cambridge and London School of Hygiene that did a, a little modeling study right here in London where they were interested in comparing two different scenarios to reach uh, greenhouse gas emission targets. And they were interested in looking at the benefits on health of two, these two different scenarios, one being purely technological solutions and the other one being behavioral changes. And the behavioral changes meaning shifting from driving to walking or cycling. And they looked at the, the, the potential benefits of these, these two different types of approaches uh, to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and looking at, the, again, the, the health benefits. And what they found is, yes, of course, you do get some health benefits from the technological changes, but you get 30 times the benefits from the behavioral change scenario, from mode shifts and walking and cycling. And why is that? Because in the technological change scenario, the only benefit you got was air pollution reduction in terms of health, direct health benefits. So you get direct health benef benefits and you get 17 deaths per million in London uh, avoided thanks to the technological scenario. But when you look at the behavioral change scenario about walking and cycling, yes, you do get some improvements in terms of air pollution with 21 reductions in, uh, per million people uh, in deaths, but you get so much more impact from physical activity. So if you start looking at a much more holistic picture and, not start, and you don't think only narrowly about addressing air pollution, then you can see that a better, 
holistic vision of health shows policies that have different types of appeal. And if you're thinking about health as the end game, as the end goal, then definitely a behavioral change is desirable. Now, in some of my own work, um, so I'm doing actually some similar types of work on the Air Quality London strategy uh, in, in London, and I'm finding very similar results to what was done by James Woodcock. I'm not showing this because they're, 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 they're too preliminary to show today. But I'm going to show you some, some results from uh, some work that I've, done, that I've done in other cities. So this is an example that of, uh, again, a, a modeling study of the health impacts of mode shifts that I did in Barcelona. And what you see once more is that by encouraging walking and cycling, so this is uh, scenarios of, tr of mode shifts from, from driving to walking, cycling, or public transportation. And what we see is that, yes, of course, you get air pollution benefits. Those are, again, deaths avoided. But you get six times more benefits from the physical activity alone than, than purely from the air pollution. So again, a ho more holistic vision of the endpoints, of the goals of the, po of, of the policies, and you find different uh, policies that emerge as being much more desirable. Now, of course, you might say, I don't blame people for not wanting to throw themselves out there in traffic. And that's perfectly understandable. In fact, the fear of, of traffic injuries is one of the most cited reasons by people for not wanting to, uh, to, to bike places, right? So fear of crime, the, the, so, so uh, fear of, of injuries. So, so, so driving cars, don't kill people direct, only uh, directly, but they also kill people indirectly because people are scared of the traffic injuries. And only, and it's true, I mean, the, the, the cycling and walking is more dangerous than driving or taking public transportation per kilometer traveled. And also when you're in, in a car, when you're in your, on a bike or when you're walking, you end up inhaling more air pollution. You have a greater intake of air pollution. Not because the environment is, is less polluted, because in fact, inside cars is often the most polluted environment, but because you're physically active, you have a higher inhalation rate, and so you bring in more air pollution in your body. So indeed, you are putting yourself at, at, at greater risk by going walking and cycling from traffic injuries and from greater inhalation. But we've accounted for this uh, in, in the other, in, um, in, the, in the studies that we've done. So going back to the study that James Woodcock did, some of you might have noticed that the, um, the numbers didn't add up. It's just that it, I, I, hadn't, uh, I had left out the traffic mortality. So, so James Wilcock and his, and his colleagues did account for the fact that, yes, there are some trade-offs that by, by uh, encouraging people to bike, people are putting themselves at greater risk. So, but the, but the, the deaths, the additional deaths that you get from traffic mortality are about half the benefits you get from air pollution, at least in the case in London. And similarly, in the, in the study that I did, for example, the one that I did in Barcelona, there I not only did look uh, at traffic mortality, the, the small orange sliver there, I also looked at the additional mortality that you get from the increased inhalation and in air pollution. And that's the small red sliver. So you see, yes, even when you account for those risks, you get overwhelming benefits from uh, physical activity benefits, okay? So that, uh, I've, I've reproduced these, these types of uh, studies, of modeling studies in different types of environments, mostly in Europe. I have colleagues who've done it in the US and in, uh, in Australia. But when we did, what we did more recently, to get a more final answer in terms of this balance of risk and benefits of cycling versus air, uh, and physical activity, walking and physical activity, and uh, increase inhalation, we looked at a large range, we simulated simulations of ranges of air pollution levels and to try to understand if there's a point at which you start incurring this, bene this benefits, where you start putting yourself at greater risk by cycling or walking more, okay? So we're looking for this point where, in fact, there is a point, whether at, at there, at there's any level of air pollution at which, yes, you're starting to do yourself more harm than good because the air pollution levels are so high, okay? So what was interesting about this study is not only the results, which I'll show you in a second, but it's the impact it had in the media. It was extremely well covered. So academic papers, papers get uh, a score called an altimetric score that tells you how much it's been relayed in the media and social media. So this paper had the, big, the highest altric, uh, altimetric score 
ever reported for this one journal, and the top, it's in top 1% of, of any paper uh, uh, published and, and recorded in altmetric scores. It had uh, more than uh, 150 news stories that were, re that were directly linked, and of course there were more that, that weren't um, necessarily um, uh, linked to this. So it really, I think it really shows how much people have a real deep concern for this. That was a very popular article. So now going into the results. So I, I, I'm showing you the graphs that actually the Financial Times did for our paper because our, our paper didn't have quite as nice graphs as the Financial Times uh, did for using our data. And what this, uh, what this, uh, this graph tells you, uh, I don't have a pointer, but I think I could show you that here, it'll be easier. In the x-axis here is the amount of hours cycling per day, right? And uh, in the y-axis, in this vertical axis, is the uh, risk of mortality as you increase cycling compared to uh, not cycling. And the three colors of lines are different levels of air pollution. And in this case, we're looking at only London, and the three lines are green, London air pollution levels, average air pollution levels, so a 16 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5 every year. The red line is average rush hour traffic, uh, air pollution, and the blue line is the highest level of air pollution that you can find in a month. So if you look at the, the green and, and red line, which is really what we would most likely be exposed to every day as part of our commute, you see that you can cycle as much as you want, you're only decreasing mortality. So you're, you have lower risks of, uh, of, of dying as you increase physical activity, as you increase cycling, even, as, uh, even at those high levels of air pollution, right? So you never reach this point where you start having uh, risks rather than benefits. Now, at this very high level of, of air pollution, at the blue line, after nine hours of cycling, at this, as you see this point here, after nine hours of cycling in, in London, at this, the highest level that you can find in London, then yes, indeed, you can start getting uh, more harm than good from cycling, okay? And then if you look at uh, cities around the world, each of these lines is different cities around the world. The mo the, one, some of the most polluted cities, for example, Delhi right, he right here, one of the most polluted cities in the world, after 45 minutes of cycling, then you start getting more risk more harm than good, okay? Up to 45 minutes, you're, uh, you get, have benefits, and more you, have, you start having these benefits. But in most of the world, the, the message is quite clear. In all of Europe, and all the US, and it's only in the most polluted cities that, you can, that cycling more than 45 minutes an hour, two hours, starts to being, being a problem, okay? So the message until now has been quite good, and those were modeling studies, but we've also been conducting some uh, epidemiologic analysis. So in epidemiologic analysis, you're looking at, at monitoring in individuals, looking at how individuals progress in their disease or their markers of disease. So we did some experimental studies, the image on the left, where we put people in a high, highly uh, polluted environment and a less polluted environment. We put them either on a stationary bicycle or, on, uh, or just resting. And we looked at markers of disease before and after. And we also, and in, in, in all the studies that we did of experimental studies, so far we've seen uh, that the risks are by far, uh, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. We also did some epidemiological analysis, analysis of uh, cohort studies where we look, where you follow people in the long term. So you look at long term impacts, you look at mortality impacts, how much people die. You follow people during, for many uh, cohorts for during many years, and you try to understand what are the, the risks that, that cause uh, uh, deaths of these people. And again, we found very encouraging, positive uh, conclusions that the, w the risks of physical activity in polluted environments outweigh the, the, any, uh, the, the benefits outweigh the risks, okay? So, so far it's been quite positive. So, in general, the, the, at least in environments uh, that we find uh, in Western world, in most cases, benefits outweigh the risks. However, lately, as we've started dig digging a bit deeper in, in this new area of research, there's, there's not much done that's, that's been done in this area so far, so we don't know so much. But as we've been digging a bit deeper into this issue, as we did in this EU-funded project called the uh, PASTA, we had, 
We were able to monitor people uh, as part of their daily lives during three weeks. We looked at their, the exposure of their air pollution. We looked at their physical activity levels. We did some health markers with various uh, system to look at lung function, to look at cardiovascular function, etc. And in this case, when we were able to really look very, dig very deeply uh, into these, uh, these people, uh, people's lives and, and, and habits, we saw that in fact lung function markers, uh, something called FE, FEV1, is just a, mar a, a function of uh, a marker of lung function. We did see that as uh, air pollution increased physical activity or cycling every day actually did start uh, canceling out the benefits. So we didn't necessarily see risks of cycling, but we did see that physical activity in outdoor environments does start to cancel out in terms of lung function. And then you might also have seen in the papers not long ago, uh, a study that was developed also here at Imperial College by some other colleagues, uh, where they put older people walking in uh, Oxford Street and in Hyde Park, and they looked at health markers before and after. And also in this population, elderly people, some uh, with, with uh, some diseases, we did see uh, that the benefits of, that they got from the physical activity that they, from just walking in Hyde Park were canceled out when they did this walking in, uh, in, in Oxford Street. So not necessarily additional risk, but actually, but at least uh, cancellation of benefits in sub-subpopulations. Sub 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 so, this is a new area of research and there's not more that needs to be done, but certainly the, the, the message that we're getting is a bit more nuanced than the original modeling studies that we did. Now, of course, that's not to say that we shouldn't be walking and cycling, right? I mean, quite the opposite is we need to do a lot more to reduce air pollution. If we can't even do anything and go out for a walk and make that healthy for ourselves, then we really need to push much further in, in improving air pollution. So, that's, in a nutshell, the kind of vision that we want to create. Thinking much more holistically about air pollution allows us to think of a vision of cities that improves our health in a multi multitude of ways, and that's really what we want to reach. We have the evidence that a holistic approach will trigger many more benefits. It makes sense if you just look at pictures of places where you want to live. And we have had historical precedents. It was shown by an urban sanitary movement that we can plan cities for health. It's been done before. Why not do it again today? Now, some cities have started making very bold announcements that they are going to become car-free, or at least car-less, or at least in some zones, such as uh, Milan or Copenhagen, um, Madrid, Paris, also Oslo, Hamburg, have also all made very strong and bold announcements about getting rid of cars, reducing the amount of cars, and creating healthier environments. Also, New York has made some, some uh, quite major changes. And eventually, we're going to get there. I mean, I'm convinced. Eventually, we will get rid of all those cars. We will create an, a healthy environments for ourselves. I think our children and our grandchildren, I have my two little babies here, Amelia and Arlo, and I think they will be very angry at us or maybe just laugh at us, but I think they will be angry at us in the future. I think, why did you subject us, us to living in these kinds of environments, these harmful environments, and preventing us from having a much more flourishing, happy, well-being, life full of well-being, and living in much safer, saner, healthier environments? So we're going to get there eventually. Why not make it happen now? So looking forward to your comments. I just want to especially thank two of my PhD students, Rosie Riley and Juan Pablo Orjuela, who are very helpful in making uh, and, and helping me putting those slides together. And I'm really looking forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, fr first question here. here. Um, th thank you for that. That was an excellent presentation. Um, as, as you started, uh, you answered so many of my questions as you went along, even if I could ask you. But my question is about um, demographics. And mm -hmm. you touched on it already, because you said that further in, uh, or rather further to the I'll end. I'll repeat the question, don't worry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but further to the end, um, in terms of over 60s, for example, yeah. it's obvious that, that pollution has uh, a cancelling effect on the health benefits of exercise in a polluted environment. And my question is about the other end 
of the demographic yeah. scale. So for younger yeah. people, children, for example, yeah. wh where did you see those trade-offs yeah. happening in terms of both development and impact? So the question is, uh, at the younger age, uh, do we also find this kind of uh, cancelling out of, of benefits from physical activity, if I can summarize this? Uh, so, again, this is a very new area of research and there's been very little done on this. Now, there was a study that was done in, in California uh, that looked at uh, children playing in, uh, uh, in uh, outdoor environments, playing football, doing sports in, uh, in areas at high, high levels of, of ozone. And they did find that doing exercise in areas of high levels of ozone did bring the onset of asthma. So, there's this, that's the only piece of research that I know uh, about, about looking at these trade-offs of, of benefits and risks. And in fact, in this case, they weren't really looking at the benefits of physical activity. They were only looking at impacts of air pollution and the increased inhalation from, uh, from, uh, from exercising. And there's, it's a very new area. Clearly, uh, the, uh, children are much more vulnerable. Their, their lungs are, are growing, their brains are growing, all their, their, their body is growing, and so inhalation is, is uh, air pollution is, is a much bigger issue for children. And we really need to do more research in this area of understanding the benefits and risks, because of course, children also need a lot of physical activity. Right here, not, right now in, in the UK, 20% of four and five year olds are already overweight or obese. I mean, that, that's a 20%. So physical activity is absolutely something that needs to be taken care of. And so, yes, it's a very difficult situation. But if we can encourage, it, it seems that if we can encourage uh, people to walk and bike, it seems like even though there might be for some uh, vulnerable groups a cancellation out of, of health benefits at the worst air pollution levels, everyday walking and cycling for kids, so far, it seems like something that you really, we, we really should be encouraging. And I'm very proud of my little girl who, bi who bikes to school every day. That's fine, Amelia. I don't care. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yes, my question is Sorry. about the approach. You, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. started saying that you're using a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. In reality, you're doing some kind of ecosystem. That mm. means you are just considering the ecosystem of the city. What about the political system and the economic system? They should be integrated. They should yeah. understand and go together. Yeah, so, so the, uh, this yeah. is the first question. Second mm -hmm. question, do you have enough data in order that I'm sure that this is not risky what we are going to research? So, so the first question is, is the economic system integrated? And, and indeed, of course, the economic, economic system is not integrated. We don't look at, there are plenty of externalities that are not integrated in, in the way we make decisions. We look at costs of policies and, and benefits of policies in terms of improved uh, the, uh, the economic system, but we don't actually, when any of the other policies that we make, look at the, 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 the costs of the, or the savings in terms of health benefits. That's something that's typically not considered. So if you were to look at, uh, um, if you were to look at the benefits in terms of costs and most of the, the, the planning policies, in fact, you would find, and there's some studies that have done that, that you're, the economic costs are actually quite uh, impressive but they're not typically considered, so it's very disconnected. And your second question was about... Enough data. Enough data. No, no, we don't have enough data at this point. Certainly we need to... to th this, is a new, this is a new area of research. I think it's, there's enough data to say we need to reduce air pollution. There's enough data to say we need to increase physical activity. And there's... An, I would say enough data to say in most environments that we have today, we will get some, uh, if, by, by walking and cycling to go places, there may be some cancellation out for some of the worst, uh, for some of the, of the populations that are, uh, that are most vulnerable. So far we haven't seen additional uh, risk, but there may be some cancellation out of, of benefits. But there's a lot more that needs to be done. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, now I'll get you afterwards. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we use the material plastic, um, because, it's, because of its durability, we're not able to incinerate it because it will re release chemical gases. So what would be the best material to use instead of plastic? Instead of plastic, best material to use? Uh, completely outside of my range of expertise. <laughs> but thank you, a fantastic question. Uh, for, are you saying for constructing bicycles or? <laughs> In general. 
Uh, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who are better placed. Uh, uh, I would say cloth bags if you're if what you're trying to do is is doing uh, shopping and and paper, uh, for example. I mean, there are lots of different. Yeah, there was a question up there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I have done quite a few of the, uh, of, of the, so walking is generally also integrated in, in most of the, the, the modeling studies that I have done. Uh, in terms of the physical activity and air pollution studies, there has, the, air, the walking has been done, for example, in an elderly population. We uh, clearly walking has, uh, if you were to compare walking and cycling, if that's what you're, you're interested in, if you, so walking, pedestrians will have uh, lower concentrations in their environments than cyclists. So cyclists will be more exposed to air pollution than pedestrians. So in that sense, pedestrians are a bit more protected. Of course, it takes longer to go to the same place uh, cycling, uh, walking than cycling. So because you, your duration is, is, is longer in, in very polluted environments, you might end up inhaling more air pollution. Now you can, in, in environments in, in, uh, uh, where you can walk to, you often get more physical activity uh, walking than cycling simply because you take longer to get to places. For, for the same distance, it's probably overall beneficial to walk just because it takes you longer to, and so you have overall longer levels of physical activity. However, of course, you can't reach, you can't go as far away. So for example, a, a similar example would be um, the use of, of uh, electric uh, uh, bicycles, right? There's a lot of interest in electric bicycles, but you think, okay, we don't get as much exercise from electric bicycles, so they're not quite as good. But, be, but because people go much further with electric bicycles, even though you get less physical activity per kilometer traveled, because people travel a lot more, they end up getting exactly the same level of physical activity than, than the people who bike. Yes, I'm not... Exactly. Yeah, so, so yes, in, in the modeling studies that I showed, we integrate, so the, the scenarios all were for whatever uh, distance that people drove, depending on the distance, we converted the, the modes to either uh, public transportation, walking or cycling. So yes, uh, uh, public transportation is, I definitely consider an active form of transportation and people get benefits from it, absolutely. Yeah? Oh, you mean injuries rather than dying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so we have. So, we, so in fact, uh, in some of the studies, we, we didn't look only at mortality. Mortality is, is, is easier to explain. But we also look, looked at injuries and converted all the the, the injuries and diseases into some, something called DALI, a disability adjusted life here. And so, instead of uh, of deaths, number of deaths, we have numbers of DALIs that are saved, or and that includes injuries, includes all the diseases that you get, and you get some, the, the message is exactly the same. You get the similar types of results, absolutely. Yeah, uh, up above, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as you get away from the exhaust, it, it very quickly goes down, particularly for uh, pollutants like nitrogen di uh, dioxide or very small ultrafine particles, the, the smallest of the particles. As you move away from the exhaust, very quickly it goes down. So that's why you find that pedestrians are already uh, uh, often ha half the, have the half the exposures than, than cyclists, so sometimes even more, just from the small distance being on one side of the sidewalk compared to right next to the exhaust, right next to the, the curb, 
has already very measurable and significant differences. So yes, the decay function uh, next to, uh, to traffic uh, goes, quite, uh, 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 goes down quite quickly. So we get, for example, in background monitoring stations or background, um, um, when you monitor air pollution in background areas away from traffic, you get about half the, uh, the amount of uh, concentration, 50% less than when you're in traffic. So, if you, so that's an advantage of when you walk in your bike, you can actually often use, choose uh, routes that are less, uh, that have less air pollution. And in fact, uh, we see that uh, people make choices, when people make different choices, they, they can reduce 30 to 50% their concentration, their exposures by using routes that are less exposed. Yeah? Yeah, they're, they're, I'll come back to you, but there are plenty more. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry, you, yes. Excellent question. How to change people's minds? So I, I think about this quite a lot, um, and I that's that's an, that's something I don't have an answer. I mean, I, I what what I do personally is I try to bring this message out, saying, look, it's this is something that's good for you. Uh, so I have some uh, my PhD student Rosie Riley, who's working on uh, on developing an app where she can communicate, on, where we communicate with people on air pollution. And there are some air pollution uh, apps that are out there. We're trying to come up with something that, she, Rosie might be here, no? Uh, we're trying to come up with, with a way that's, uh, where we really research the question of how you communicate on air pollution, how you communicate on health, to be able to provide uh, through an app something, some, some uh, very targeted um, encouragements for healthier, more sustainable types of behaviors. Because we know that in the case of air pollution, people can often very, get very disengaged if you just tell, if you scare them with air pollution, then they just think, okay, that's too complicated, it's not for me. But if you can give very actionable, like precisely, this is what you can do to improve your health, very precise me messages that are, that are feedback to your own personal life, which is something that you can do with an app, because with an app you can also uh, record people's lives, understand where they've been, what kind of physical activity. So if you come back to somebody and say, this is what you've done, this is how you can do better, then we're hoping that that's something that, that, that will be able to engage people in, in healthier behaviors. So we're working on that, also working on, on trying to change the minds of politicians. And that's even, because in the end, that's what we need. Now, if all of us were to write to our politicians and say, this is what we need, of course, that would change their mind. But yes, this is an excellent question. In the end, we, I think we have plenty of research to show the benefits of, of better planning practices. What we're missing is how do we convince the decision makers to make it happen? I fully agree. Thank you for that question. Yes. So, Absolutely. So there's only, there's not only, of course, the, the production of the electric cars, the production of the, the batteries, which can be quite polluting, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's also displacement of where the air pollution is because the, the electricity doesn't come out of thin air, it has to be produced. So, but not only that, but actually, uh, if you're looking at particulate matter in, in particular, in fact, the reduction uh, of uh, emissions from electric vehicles is not very big because uh, as, as, as we get better with technology, more and more of, of the uh, emissions that come from cars doesn't come from the exhaust. It comes from tire and brake wear, from abrasion, from, from sus resuspension uh, of dust. So none of that is, is changed by electric vehicles. And in fact, because electric vehicles tend to be a bit uh, heavier than other vehicles, they, they, they tend to, to produce uh, more particulate matter from, from tire and brake wear. So yes, you are reducing overall, uh, particularly nitrogen dioxide, yes, you're, you're, you're reducing quite considerably, at least locally, uh, but particulate matter is not, not, not as obvious. Yeah. Do you work uh, with London city planners, and do you know if they're bringing about any changes using your research? Yeah, so for example, the, the, the picture that I just showed you uh, there, I don't know if anybody recognized that. It's Oxford Street. So Oxford Street is going pedestrianized, right? So that's the plan. No. Okay. 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 <laughs> that's, that's depressing. Okay, well. Clearly, we need, um, uh, I mean, I th I, yes, I, I, 
we, so we do work with planners. We do try to make these things happen. There's something very important that ha that's happened in London, which is the, the new transportation strategy has what's called a healthy street approach very much at, it, at, at its center. And the healthy street approach means that any new type of redevelopment, development, any kind of new infrastructure and, and investment that's happening on transportation and in streets in London has to uh, follow the healthy streets approach. Now, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. It's not... So I think the mayor today is not making those grand announcements that other cities are making, but by saying all of our future uh, uh, developments are going to take the healthy street approach, which covers all these benefits of, of walking, cycling, of social interaction, of green space and all that, then maybe w there will be some, some, uh, some changes. But I'm quite shocked to hear about the cancellation of Oxford Street. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the benefits of cars. Yes. Um, I know it's controversial. But I just no, no, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, so, cars grew up and displaced walking. That's a historical fact. Mm -hmm. That tells me that for the people involved in making those choices, mm -hmm. cars had a benefit. That boundedly rational beings, they decided to choose cars. And indeed, that benefit must have been greater than the financial cost of buying those cars and running them. Otherwise, as economically rational beings, they wouldn't have done that. So, clearly, cars. Yeah. Yeah. For the individuals yeah, so I think... Uh, mm -hmm. It might also be that individuals, knowing that they'll be face a health penalty, might say, well, actually, the benefit that I get from being able to use the car, I'm prepared to sacrifice a year of life for mm -hmm. that benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. The, yeah, know, okay, so the benefits of... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. It's, I think it's completely fair. We're looking at all kinds of trade-offs, and and of course, by somebody who loves to drive, will have some make have to make a trade-off by not driving and, and walking instead. So yes, there are benefits of cars that we can be thinking about. Uh, it's, I think we live in, in and what's happened is that because. Uh, people perceived at some point that there are lots of benefits of cars. We then planned for cars instead of planning for human beings. And so now it's not just that people uh, uh, choose to drive because they like to drive. It's because often they don't have a choice. So that's why it's not just a rational choice at, uh, and for somebody's own uh, pleasure. It's just that we have to plan c uh, cities to make the right choice, be the easier, more comfortable, uh, safer and for everybody and the choice that people really want to make. Yes, you've had your head up for a long time. <laughs> I, I thought the issue with, um, with pollution with cars wasn't just the nexus between the car owner and the car's pollution, but the externalities, third parties who don't own the car, who suffer the pollution that the car owner mm -hmm. is producing. And those externalities have to be taken into yeah. account. But that, that's just a response to that question. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So externalities need to be taken into account. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My, my whole question is that within the context of London mm -hmm. and air pollution, Heathrow and city airports, air, uh, air, air traffic, also causes air pollution mm -hmm. for the people who are local there. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any studies about that and the relative importance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, I recently saw a, st a study, but I, 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 I can't remember where I saw this, that in fact, the, some of the pollution that was, that they found high levels of air pollution at Heathrow Airport, uh, on some days, they, by looking at the, the wind direction, they actually realized that, th that the high levels of air pollution in Heathrow was from, from traffic, <laughs> from traffic around rather than, uh, because there's some uh, high levels of air pollution sometimes, not, ne not necessarily when, when there's a lot of uh, uh, planes flying, but, but it's just coming from traffic. But yes, of course, uh, Heathrow does, does contribute a lot. And it's not an area that, that I'm much of an expert in, but yes, the, there's, uh, I, in some of the modeling studies that we, we did where we looked at different try to, types of uh, policy scenarios, we saw that the, some of the most advanced policy scenarios for transportation in London uh, we saw that most of the all of the all the boroughs in London did reach the recommended levels or the the limit values, uh, the EU limit values, except the he Heathrow because of Heathrow. But you know, it's not an area I'm an expert in. <laughs> but yes, one last question? No, one last? Uh, no, great. Thank you. So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, no, that, so that's a, 
That's right. No, that does happen in London. The 21st of June is going to be, what is it? 21st of June is, is it air pollution day or air quality day or something like that? It's the 21st of June. And there's a car-free day, which is international, is in September, 22nd of September, if I remember right. So those things do happen. I think London is so big and there's so many things happen that they get more diluted than in places that are a bit more compact. Uh, but uh, no, it does happen. But there needs to be a lot more. I can fully agree with you. There needs to be a lot more to, to bring the message out. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Right.